when we look at the stunningly beautiful landscape of the Grand Canyon and ask the question, how did it get here? Can we rewind history and reconstruct the series of events that shaped major landscapes such as the Grand Canyon? The traditional scientific answer is that the Colorado River gradually cut down the canyon over the course of millions of years. However, in recent decades, this view has been challenged not only by young Earth creationists, but also many mainstream geologists have recognized the fingerprints of catastrophe at the Grand Canyon. But before we examine specific theories in greater detail, I'm going to step back and remind us of two basic principles about how erosion shapes the landscape. From that foundation, we can begin recognizing the fingerprints of catastrophe ourselves and separate them from the present processes that are changing the landscape on a small scale today. We'll return to the Grand Canyon in about five minutes, but first we'll start our exploration by following the Colorado River upstream. After taking a left at the Green River, we come to an area known as Nine Mile Creek. This area is interesting, as you can see, because even though the canyon size is similar to the Colorado or the Green Rivers, there's only a tiny creek winding through the middle today. Using this as a case study, I'm going to draw out two principles that we will apply in a couple minutes when we return to the Grand Canyon. First, erosion and deposition are a conjugate pair. We cannot have one without the other. Everywhere we see erosion, we know there must be corresponding deposition. And everywhere we see deposition, we know there must be corresponding erosion. Each of these semicircular highlighted deposits in red was created by sediment that eroded out of the mountains, moved downhill by water, and deposited in what is called an alluvial fan. Erosion and deposition shape the landscape together and neither can exist alone without the other. When looking at a landscape such as the Grand Canyon region, every feature is shaped by one or both of these processes, and these clues will help us to identify which events came first, which events are dominant. And this brings me to our second principle, sequence and scale. Notice the tiny creek meandering through the canyon bottom. How is that creek interacting with these alluvial fans? And how is it interacting with the larger channel? Would you say that the creek is dominating the landscape? Or would you say that the fans are dominating the landscape? I'll zoom in a little more, and it's pretty clear to see that the fans are in control. The creek might be taking little nibbles around the edges, but the fans are filling in the canyon from both sides, forcing the creek to the opposite edge. Now imagine if we fast forward for a million years. How far would this tiny creek cut down into the canyon? In reality, the opposite might occur. The fans might end up choking off the stream to create a lake. So for a principle number two, the scale of the event is more important in shaping the landscape than the duration of the event. Time is not enough. This principle of scale works in reverse as well. We cannot simply rewind one million years to understand how the larger Nine Mile Canyon was formed. As we zoom out again, it is clear that the large canyon must have been shaped by a river on the scale of the modern day Green River. This tiny creek could not have carved out this canyon. Something must have changed in the past. Time is not enough to understand this landscape. There must have been more water flowing through the canyon in the past in order to cause the evidence of erosion that we see today. Panning back to the Grand Canyon, we see these two principles on display in several examples. First, notice how erosion and deposition are always occurring. For each of the fan deposits along the Colorado River, there's a corresponding erosion source. For each eroded channel, there is a corresponding depositional location. And we will drill down in more detail in future episodes. But for now, recognize that for every instance of erosion, there must be a deposit. And for every instance of deposition that we see, there must be a source of erosion. 
Sometimes the deposition is far away from the source. Secondly, observe that the Colorado River today is unable to erode these alluvial fans. In location after location, the Colorado River is filling in with sediment. If we fast forward a million years, how much deeper will the river cut down into this landscape? Not much. In fact, if the present is indeed the key to the future, it looks like the Grand Canyon is about as deep as it will ever be. Just like in the Nine Mile Creek example, we recognize the evidence that something has changed. And secular scientists agree, unlike our attempts to decipher distant geological events, we actually do know why the Colorado River has changed within recent history. According to the National Park Service, the Glen Canyon Dam has dramatically altered the seasonal water flow. Prior to the dam's construction, the seasonal spring snowmelt would swell the river by 300 to 600 times the seasonal low in late summer. In the past, the downcutting of the canyon occurred during these spring floods, because the floodwaters could carry tremendous amounts of sediment and had the power to sweep huge rocks downstream. This description from the National Park Service perfectly illustrates our second principle. Time is not enough. The tremendous spring floods last just a few weeks each year. Most of the time, nothing is happening. So in order to rewind history at the Grand Canyon, we need to be looking for the fingerprints of scale, the fingerprints of catastrophe. Stay tuned as we continue digging deeper to rewind the history of the Grand Canyon.